Okay, so I'll talk a little bit today about motivation and what that looks like and means uh, in terms of psychology. So first, we should define what motivation is. Uh, and motivation are needs or desires that serve to energize or direct our behavior. That is, it's something that drives us to do something. Uh, and that varies from person to person, those sorts of things. But in general, uh, the primary drives that we find for motivation are hunger, thirst, the need to sleep, and the drive to reproduce. Secondary drives are drives, uh, desires, or needs to uh, obtain learned reinforcers. Things like money, social acceptance, social status, those sorts of things uh, are secondary drives that eventually uh, we can use sometimes to get primary drives. Um, but what really drives us is the need to survive. Uh, eat, drink, sleep, and reproduce. Uh, so that's what we've got going on in terms of motivation. There are a few th there are a few theories that link try to link um, neurophysiology, that is like the biology of the brain, and uh, the motivated behavior. And so there are the four main ones are what are known as instinct theory, and this is really um, supported by evolutionary psychologists this is their main idea and it's the idea that the learnings of specific species of species specific behavior uh is the deep down motivation for that is what is necessary to survive so each species has like specific behavior that they follow and human behavior is obviously vastly different from most other animals um, but all of that is driven by this innate desire to survive and obviously that may sound like a little overwhelming um, or doesn't make sense to you none of these theories perfectly describe um, motivation or behavior the next one is arousal theory and arousal as we use it in, in psychology deals with alertness and activation uh, not just in a sexual way but in any way and uh, according to arousal theory there's an optimal optimal level of arousal for any given task um, and you want to hit kind of that that sweet spot of the uh, alertness and activation to complete your given task. And there is a uh, a law called the yerkes dodson law that says uh, if you give someone a task that is too easy, they will uh, not enjoy it, not be as motivated to do it. If you give someone a task that is too hard, they will also lose motivation. Uh, and so you need to say find a task that's of moderate difficulty in order to elicit the highest levels of performance. So we perform our best when we find a task that is neither too easy nor too hard. Okay. Uh, then there's something called the opponent process theory, which says humans start at a motivation baseline. And at that motivation baseline, we are not uh, motivated to act at all. So from this unmotivated place, baseline of essentially zero, we occasionally encounter stimuli and if we find a stimulus that makes us feel good that creates then a motivation to seek out that same stimulus um, and so we try to refine it so that it, we can feel good again now this theory really helps explain addiction right and uh, if we find something that makes us feel good we keep going back to it and going back to it and going back to it in order to continue feeling good um, how much that's true or not, again, up for debate. That's the opponent process. And then there's the drive reduction theory. And it's the idea is that psychological needs put stress on bodies. And uh, we are then motivated to reduce this negative experience um, to return to homeostasis, right? And so this is the idea of the homeostatic regulation. It's this perfect state of equilibrium. And as we move away from it, as we move away from it, we want to return back to that equilibrium. Our body enjoys being in balance according to drive reduction. And so psychological needs and physiological needs even put the stress on the body. This creates that imbalance and we remove ourselves from homeostasis and we try to uh, get back to it. So those are kind of ways of looking at uh, the neurophysiology and motivated behavior. There are then kind of four other categories for behavioral theories that we'll look at, or motivational theories, I'm sorry, that we'll look at. Um, one of those is the biological. And early theories really uh, relied on biological explanations, almost strictly. And uh, 
this is because animals, and especially lower intellect animals, or lower animals on the uh, intellect scale as you would have it, um, are thought to be motivated by what's called instinct. And instinct is defined as genetically programmed uh, patterns of behavior. We know how certain animals are going to act based off of uh, their instincts. And so that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, and so these early theories, uh, along with arousal theory and drive reduction, they help provide us an understanding that the role nature plays in motivating behavior, which is certainly a role, right? N I don't think anyone nowadays would argue that it is the only role, because that would take away humans' aspects to act independently and individually, but certainly there is some role that biology and nature plays in motivating our behavior. There's also the humanistic theory, uh, and the main one behind this is Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. Um, and he, so he created this, this pyramid that shows uh, a way to organize the needs, and each lower level must be met in, before you can move on to the next one, essentially. Now, Maslow bases this off of Western uh, society and Western standards, and so it's not, it's not necessarily cross-cultural, and it has run into some uh, pushback for being Western-centric, and that, that's, that's probably a fair critique of it. Uh, but it works as kind of a baseline as a way to get us thinking about things, right? Until we have our physiological needs met, that is, are we eating, are we sleeping, those sorts of things. Uh, we can't worry really about our safety, and until we have our physiology and our safety met, we don't really care about love and belonging, and then we can move up to esteem. And finally is that self-actualization, which Maslow argues is this like way of humans finding meaning in their life and finding their purpose and their drive and their goals. So according to humanistic theory, these needs come from physiological drives, as well as the higher order uh, or psychological needs, right? Safety, belonging, and love and achievement. So it's, it's shifting away from that biology of, hey, it's just about survival, it's just about instinct, it's just about meeting physiological needs, and it's saying, no, there are these psychological needs that humans have as well that really make us distinct from most other species. And so uh, this hierarchy of needs can help play our motivation out. There are also cognitive theories. Um, cognitive psychologists would break up factors that motivate behavior into two different groups, intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Uh, intrinsic are factors that originate in ourselves, and extrinsic are factors that come in from the outside. Um, and so they say that there's some balance between these two that leads us to be motivated. Uh, and what's interesting is there's been a lot of research done into this, and, and what they found is that over time, intrinsic motivation may decrease if we receive extrinsic rewards for that same behavior. So if there's something that we love doing, and we are doing it because we love it, because that's our intrinsic reward, if we start getting extrinsic rewards for doing it, over time we may become less likely to do that. I think a great example is when we're young, most kids love to read. It's an intrinsic motivation to read. As they get older, you may get extrinsic rewards for that same behavior. Grades, uh, stickers, some AR points, or pizza parties, or whatever it may be. And so eventually that intrinsic motivation to read goes away. And this is called the over-justification effect. Um, you also have within like motivation, there are two main ideas. Uh, that are important as intrinsic motivators, and one is self-determination, that is that belief that you are in control of your own destiny, uh, and that you are responsible for yourself and your actions, that you have influence over them. And the other is, and it's related to self-determination, is um, self-efficacy, which is the belief of whether we can or cannot uh, achieve a particular goal that we have uh, set for ourselves, or other have uh, set for us. In terms of social theories, and this is building off the cognitive theory, um, another one of them is, is concerned with the need to avoid cognitive dissonance, and it ties really into drive theory. It's this idea that we're motivated to reduce tension that, do, that exists due to conflicting thoughts or choices, um, and that people tend to change attitudes to fit behavior patterns. Um, as long as, and then this goes back to the cognitive theory, right, and self-determination, they believe that they are in control of those actions and choices. 
So we're moving away from the biology, which is where nature controls us, to really this higher order thinking where it's like, no, we control ourselves. We are making our choices. Um, so that's important. Then there's also this kind of belief that there are four different types of conflict, or theory at least. Uh, and so this theory says that there are four conflicts. One is the approach approach, and that is when you have to decide between two desirable options. If there are two good choices, you really have to decide between those two, and that's kind of tough. The other is avoidance avoidance. It's where you have to choose between two unpleasant alternatives. Sometimes we call this choosing the lesser of two evils, uh, and that's another type of conflict that leads to this dissonance, perhaps. One is, uh, the third kind is called approach avoidance, which you're only presented with, in this scenario, you're only presented with one choice, and it carries pluses and minuses. And so, like, it's if you want to go to a specific college, because that's the only one that has your major, but it's unbelievably expensive. It has its plus and its minus. And that's your choice. Uh, and then the last type of conflict is multiple approach avoidance, which where you are presented with many options, but none of those options is perfect. Each have positive and negatives. And this creates, according to this social theory, uh, some motivation to make a choice, right? This conflict leads to motivation. And so those are some of the theories that start looking at motivation as we are concerned about it in psychology.